Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk in the afternoon. Uh, so yeah, simple alternatives to Google Analytics. Um, I'll get started here. So I work in OIT, Princeton University, in a group called Web Development Services. I'm a solutions architect there. Uh, I've been working there like eight years or so, seven or eight years. Um, I've been working in Drupal much longer, probably 12 years or so. Uh, there's not too much Drupal specific stuff in this talk. Uh, this is pretty broadly applicable to anything you're doing on the web. Um, but yeah, this is the group I work for. So um, my day to day work, uh, I help build and maintain a site building platform we call Princeton Site Builder. Uh, that's Drupal based. We have oh, close to a thousand sites on it. And um, uh, I got uh, into this specific topic, uh, web analytics. Um, where I just started like over the past few years getting more interested in data and um, how we're using data to like better inform decisions we make when we're building features and doing things on the platform. Um, so uh, WDS, we, we sort of do like everything for websites. We're like a little full service agency within Princeton. So we've got project management, design, and um, development, content strategy, everything you would need to build a website we can do. Uh, so why web analytics to begin with, I think it's important that we just take kind of a step back and think about like, you know, what is web analytics and why do we care about it? Um, you know, we, in my, my uh, day job, we build websites all day. And I think it's important that for the people that are building these websites, that the content that you're spending a lot of time writing, you know that people are actually reading it. Um, and you're not just wasting your time. Um, there's a certain level of content that maybe needs to be up there regardless if people are reading it or not for things like regulatory concerns and things like that. But even then, you know, it's helpful to know that the content that you put on the website is structured in such a way that people are actually finding it easy to, to find and um, you're getting viewership. Um, and if not, like, what data, what tools do you have at your disposal to make it easier to fix those problems? Um, you know, being able to track and compare changes over time is important, and this is what we use web analytics software for. Google Analytics also, um, I'm sure most people in this room are probably aware if you're here at this talk, they transitioned to a whole new version of the platform and they forced everybody onto it in the middle of last year. Um, it's called Google Analytics 4. The four comes from, obviously, the fourth iteration, but the previous version was not really known as Google Analytics 3. It was known as Universal Analytics. And it's sort of a ground up rewrite of how the analytics platform works in Google. And what sort of sparked my interest in web analytics specifically was we were sort of scrambling as platform maintainers of a platform where we have like a thousand websites that many of which are using Google Analytics. Well, there's, there was no like migration path really for your data, at least when it was initially announced, to get all of this information from the old version of GA into the new version. So when I started looking into it, I'm like, well, if we're going to force people to do this like manual migration path and set up a new property in Google Analytics for Google Analytics 4, maybe we should start looking at alternative options too um, to see if there's something better out there. Because I think we've all sort of... Uh, you know, come to know Google Analytics is something that's difficult to use unless you're really in it every day, all day, and we're not. Um, certainly our site owners aren't, for except for um, a small minority of them. So, you know, what else is out there? I mean, Google Analytics is, you know, this graph here is from a, a website called w 3 Techs. They do like analytical surveys on like software that's used on the web. And this graph is showing just how big Google Analytics um, is and how much market share they have. The top uh, colored bar on each of these items here just represents of all of the websites that w 3 Techs has scanned for this information, how many are running that piece of software. So over half of the websites are running Google Analytics. And the bottom bar is of the ones that are running analytics at all, how many are using it? So Google Analytics owns 84% of the market. 
which is absolutely insane, right? And I think that's why everybody uses it. It's just what you know. Everybody knows that that's the thing to use. But um, how much time do we really spend looking at alternatives? And another thing that sparked this is uh, the GDPR regulation, um, since for a general data protection regulation uh, that was passed in the European Union, I think in 2016. And it sort of made like Google Analytics illegal <laughs> in a lot of uh, you know senses of the word. I'm not a lawyer, but you know you can find plenty of information on the internet saying people were scrambling um, when that was announced. Like, hey, can I still even use Google Analytics on my site? Um, so now, anytime you visit a site that caters mostly to like a European audience, um, you see those cookie consent banners. Uh, so that's something you certainly need to be doing if you're doing Google Analytics. Okay. And the simpler solutions I'm going to get into don't even register on this chart, okay? They have like 1% or less of market usage because I think in large part, it's really tough to not Google off of anything. And uh, they're newer sites uh, or services that mostly cropped up after GDPR was passed. So Google Analytics, why use it? Um, Google knows an insane amount of information about everybody. It doesn't just get this information from the tracking script for Google Analytics that are on websites, it can combine data that it has from uh, other sources about you, about visitors to your site. If you're logged into um, Gmail, if you're logged into other Google platforms, um, it takes all that information and is able to offer information to your analytics software that other solutions really can't provide because Google just has such an expansive um, software ecosystem. For example, you can uh, turn on demographic tracking, Google Analytics, that'll give you access to gender and age group information, which is not something that your browser is telling Google Analytics when you visit a website. It's just something Google can infer about you based on all the other stuff that you do on the internet that has Google stuff involved in it. Um, they have very advanced capabilities. They're tracking a lot of stuff. Um, you can track user journeys and conversions. There's a big emphasis in Google Analytics on monetization. Uh, you'll especially see that if you look at Google Analytics 4, where they sort of have this natural progression of um, tracking and viewing reports based on acquisition and then to engagement and finally to monetization. But that's like the ultimate goal is what you want to extract money from your visitors, right? That's not necessarily the goal of everybody that's using web analytics, right? Especially in a higher ed sense. Um, a lot of our websites, we're not really out to make money from our visitors. Well, we, you know, we want to know who's visiting the website, right? So why not use it? I think it's overkill for a lot of the basic needs of analytics. Um, it gives Google even more data. Uh, I think people are becoming more and more privacy conscious and more and more aware of the data that they're sharing with people. Um, GDPR was passed 2016 or so. California has their own version. Other states are passing versions of that uh, where they're trying to like get the data back in the ownership of the visitor. Um, and using Google Analytics, you're just sort of like feeding the beast. Um, giving them more and more information about you, which a lot of people don't like. Um, it's complicated to use. It requires a lot of education and training. If you go on LinkedIn Learning, for example, and you just search Google Analytics, there's like 30 to 40 hours of training just on Google Analytics alone. Um, so if you, and you know, there's certifications and stuff you can get for it. So it's, you know, if you have a really simple site or even, you know, um, a few simple sites, it's probably not really um, applicable for you. So, and then the data privacy concern I talked about. And uh, I should mention that Google Analytics 4 has this um, consent mode that you can opt into, and it's meant to integrate with those like consent cookie banners that you see in a lot of websites where um, you can tell Google Analytics 4 to basically disable certain tracking features depending on what the user consented to or not. Um, that alone requires some information like training and education to use. I read through a lot of the documentation on it and it is quite confusing. There's lots of different consent modes you can put it in. Um, it's really meant to integrate with those, like, uh, those cookie banners. And if you really use it in like the strictest privacy sense, it really handicaps the type of data that you're getting from Google Analytics. Okay. So let's take a step back and think about what are the basic essentials that I think a lot of people need to see when they're looking at web analytics. 
page views, number one, right? You just want to see raw numbers, how many people are actually visiting this page. Referrals, where is the traffic coming from? Um, the types of devices people are using to browse your website is important when you're doing web design. You want to know not necessarily anymore the, the browsers because um, with the exception of like maybe Safari now, most browsers, um, they, they're, they're, they're constantly adopting new technologies and iteration, and iterating on it and putting out new releases all the time. It's not like it was 10 years ago. Um, but still knowing the screen size, that's the big one, right? You want to know like how wide someone's browser is so that, hey, if 90% of my traffic is coming from mobile, we should really make sure the mobile experience is good. And it's easy to forget that when you're working on a desktop computer all day with a massive 4K monitor. Um, and then just being able to do date filtering comparisons. I think those are the absolute essentials you would need, right? Um, nice to haves would be things like time on page. So, you know, of your users, like, are they actually engaging with my website? How long are they sticking around? Having um, a count of unique visitors. So, you know, if someone's visiting five or six pages, I want to know, is that one person or five people? Um, that could be interesting information to have. Campaign tracking, so if you're sending out like email campaigns to do things like soliciting donations or engagement in something, you want to be able to track that the traffic that came to your website originated from that, right? So um, you'll see the reference to UTM codes. Um, UTM is reference to, it's like a urchin tracking module. It's like the original version of Google Analytics. They bought something called urchin. Um, that's what that originates from. And it's a way of tracking like the source and medium of uh, sources like that. And then we're talking about like events, things that are not really page views, but like downloads and um, outbound link clicks. And they're just seeing real time viewership. So we have to think about is Google Analytics actually presenting that essential information in an easy way? Um, so let's take a look. <laughs> um, so I have up here Google Analytics 4. Um, on our site builder documentation website. So like I said in the beginning of the talk, um, we run this platform at Princeton called Princeton Site Builder, and we have a website, sitebuilder.princeton.edu. This is like the website that describes the platform and has documentation on it, right? So I put up tracking code on there for Google Analytics and three other simple analytics alternatives that I'll get into. Um, but this is the page you land on when you're looking at it. And so like, okay, I want to look how many page views am I getting? You can kind of infer that maybe by the users here. Um, and I see there's like a little drop down arrow here and like, okay, I'm already overwhelmed with choices here. Uh, so maybe I don't want to look at users, but I want to look at something else or I can do choose for me with a little sparkle. Uh, so I'm already a little confused here. Um, where I'm seeing this graph. I'm immediately met with a, another graph where I'm seeing users in the last 30 minutes. I don't think users in the last 30 minutes is an essential tracking information that you would have. I think that's more of a special use case that you might have if you're launching like something big or you have a big event happening, then you want to track in real time. But again, I don't think that's the 90% use case. Um, down here, we have some suggested for you things. So views by page title, that's really what I was looking for originally, right? Um, but it's in this tiny little graph here. Everything's cut off. Seeing it by page title by default is not super helpful to me at times. Um, I'd rather see it by path, I think, uh, because a lot of page titles can be um, not as descriptive as the path would be. Um, so let's see, can I change that? No, but I see there's a cutoff link down here where it seems like I might be able to view more information there. Um, and then I've got, you know, users and by country, which is interesting information. Uh, this is pretty interesting, sessions and what channel they're coming from, but it's not really giving me the option to see um, of the referrals, what websites were referring me. Um, it's not really clear how I might be able to get to that information. And then, oh, I see there's a navigation over here. So, oh, I'm just on the home screen. Let me click reports. So now I'm met with more graphs and charts. And I see total revenue up here. I don't care about total revenue for my use case. So that's kind of just noise that I have to look past. Um, I'm seeing users and new users. Still nothing here about page views in particular. Um, uh, here's that same graph I saw down before on the right here, and then country again. I'm seeing a reference to what are my top events. 
And at Google Analytics 4, a page view is just a type of event. It's called page view. But there's also session start, a user engagement event, first visit, scroll. I don't know how that's really super helpful information to have, right? Um, now, it might seem like I'm knocking Google Analytics. I don't want to come across that way. Google Analytics is exceptional software. It is really advanced in what you can do with it. Um, I just am arguing that for a lot of users, it's overkill and it um, is overwhelming information to see. So let's make that a little more clear by expanding all of these menu options on the left. Okay, there's just so many things. These are basically pre-configured reports that Google Analytics has created for you, and you can go through them all. But it's very easy, especially if you're not someone who's even doing web as your full-time job. Maybe it's a hat that you wear in your department or something at a university to be overwhelmed with this information. Yeah, so there's lots of stuff here. But Google Analytics 4, it's important to realize they, they de-emphasize page views and they emphasize events in general. And the reason they did that is because they see the internet moving towards a sort of an app-based model where not everything is a traditional web page anymore to them. Um, so this Google Analytics 4 and something the previous version did not really allow you to do, it allows you to track um, users across your website and your applications that maybe are running on iOS or Android. Um, so you can actually track that same user across all those devices, and a page view is completely irrelevant to an app, right? So that's why it's been de-emphasized. But if you're building websites, like we still are, at least in the university setting, it's still important to have an emphasis on page views. All right, so let's get into some simpler alternatives here. So uh, the top two here, Piwik, Piwik, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, Piwik Pro and Matamo, uh, they have a shared history. They were both known as um, Piwik at one point, I think, in 2013. And then the founders wanted to monetize it, so they split off and created Piwik Pro. And um, at this point, they're very different from each other. Matamo is open source, but they do have a um, like a paid model that you can pay for where they kind of host it for you and do all, all that. But you can run Matamo self-service in your own um, systems if you prefer. But these are comparable to Google Analytics in terms of complexity. Um, Matamo might be a, a little simpler than GA, um, but it's still like a lot of information and powerful tools that you might not need. Um, plausible, Fathom, and Simple Analytics are the ones I'm going to focus on. Uh, they're simple, but they're very capable, and they present that essential information that I talked about before very clearly. Um, the bottom two, we have Cloudflare. So Cloudflare is um, sort of eating the internet now, and they've expanded to do all sorts of different service offerings, one of which is web analytics. So I'm referring to Cloudflare web analytics. Uh, it's a relatively new product to Cloudflare, and I think it's a little too simple, so I didn't really get into that. And AWS stats, or AW stats, um, and other solutions like Go Access. These are tools that you can use to do like raw log analysis of server access logs. So if you're just taking that, every time someone visits your website, it's registering that visit in a log somewhere on your web server. You could take that log information and know some things like your IP address and your uh, information about the referrer, like who sent that visitor to your website and things like that. It can extract that and like graph it for you and do things like that. But I actually think that's not really simple to use, especially for someone um, who's not a developer and someone who's not comfortable doing things in like the command line, things like that. Okay, so the commonalities of uh, this simple analytics software, so they're not free, okay? Everyone, I think, is using Google Analytics because it's free, but is it, it's free in that they're basically taking your data and like, you know, they're not selling it to anybody because they are the people you would sell it to, uh, but they're, they're certainly using it, right? And they're you know, taking all of that data, and um, that data is super valuable, right? These other smaller companies, they don't, you know, they're not selling your data. The data is 100% owned by you, um, so you have to pay them for the service. I think that's totally acceptable. I think it's a, a valid service to be paying for. Um, they're all privacy-focused, okay? So none of them use cookies to track you. Uh, they're simple, intuitive interfaces. They're very small companies. They're not based in the United States. That's mostly because they were born out of the um, GDPR regulation that was passed in, in Europe. Um, 
and there was a basically you could not host the data in the United States and be compliant with GDPR. Um, they have very very small tracking scripts. So if you care about front end performance, um, the average script size for these is like less than three kilobytes. Google Analytics. There's many ways to embed it. You, you can use like um, GTag or you can use um, Tag Manager, um, but it's at least like 100 kilobytes. So we're talking about like 25 to 100 times larger. Um, they all provide the same essential metrics. They can import from Google Analytics and there's a very small processing delay. They all also claim that you do not need to do like a cookie consent banner if you're using them. Um, I know in the United States that's not as relevant, although it could be if you're catering mostly people in California and things like that. This is just a high level comparison. We're talking about like cost. So they all tend to agree on like using the same sort of billing model where they're talking about data points, which is just like when you send a little ping to their servers, that counts as a data point. So every page view counts. If you're doing custom events, like when someone clicks a file to download it, that counts as a, pay, uh, a data point. So like per 100,000 data points per month, you know, we're looking at less than $20 a month, which I think is, is not too bad. The company size, like I said, they're very small companies. Simple Analytics is the smallest of them all. There's only like two or three full-time employees and they have contractors. I've talked to all of them. Um, Plausible is the largest of them, and I talked mostly to their support, but their support was very helpful. For Simple Analytics and Fathom, I talked directly to the co-founders. Um, they're, you know, small is good, I think, in a sense, because they're willing to iterate quickly on feature development, where you wouldn't get that with a larger company. Um, you can see where they're based, their tracking scripts. Um, Plausible is completely open source, source, which is nice. Um, you could actually run it on-prem. They have a version of it called Community Edition that they just announced this year. Uh, so if you don't want to pay that $19 a month, you don't have to, you could run their, their software, but you lose out on things like their spam mitigation that they're doing in the cloud and things like that. You'd have to do all that on your own. Um, all of them, you know, you own the data, you can delete your data, it's off their servers. Um, data retention is mostly unlimited, they have APIs and they can do email reports. So the first one we're going to talk about is simple analytics. Uh, this is the, just a high level pros and cons of it. Um, yeah, they, it's interesting, they're the, the smallest company and they're the only ones I saw that had an AI chatbot. So I think if you were to, I hate to say this, if you were to Google for um, simple alternatives to Google Analytics, um, there's a lot of them. You know, I picked these three because I, you know, searching on like Hacker News and Reddit, these are the ones that a lot of people are using and have had positive experiences with. But there are dozens and dozens of them, and a lot of them all look the same. In fact, you'll see, I'm going to demo the interfaces for all three of these. They look very similar. Um, but they, so they're trying to differentiate themselves. They have an AI chatbot, and it's sort of interesting to have an AI chatbot for something like analytics because you might have a lot of open-ended type questions that you have about your data that you don't want to spend the time clicking through a user interface to drive, right? You just want to be like, okay, for people that were using, um, uh, you know, mobile phone-sized devices, how how much has um, our traffic increased this year compared to the same time last year? And you can ask that of the Simple Analytics AI and it would produce that information for you, which is nice. Um, okay, cons, accessibility is a big one. Uh, the, there's color contrast issues. Um, it's clearly meant for people that are using a keyboard and mouse set to, to walk through. Um, the interface can be a bit slow. I'm pretty sure the servers are hosted in the Netherlands, which is probably why. Um, doesn't support multiple users. The filters UI is not great. So this is a simple analytics for sitebuilder.princeton.edu in the past 30 days. And you can see when I installed the tracking script, it wasn't exactly a month ago, it was a little after that. Um, but we can see here, this is, this is it, pretty much, right? There's, there's a few navigation tools up here, like I said, to get to AI, events, goals, and visitors, but that key essential information I talked about is all front and center. So we've got visitors, page views, time on page, and then we've got a graph to show that over time. We've got a date picker, which I said was essential, right? So right now I'm looking at a month, but I can go back to three months, um, and that's not gonna be super helpful because I don't have data in there for that, but I can look at the past week instead. And I can change the granularity of the data, so instead of showing like the resolution for uh, daily, I can look at it hourly instead. So these are like you know nice, simple little things, and you can talk about what I said, it's kind of slow. You can see the loading spinner still going here. Um, yeah. But then we have referrals, pages, devices, browsers, and countries. Um, 
This is the basic information. If you gave somebody this who has never used a web analytics software before, they would probably be able to figure it out within five to 10 minutes, right? And they could answer basic questions about the data. Um, and you can just click any of these and it'll automatically filter the rest of the thing. So like, I just am interested in looking at the search page, for example. So you just click search and it adds a filter and everything is gonna be filtered by that. And uh, there you go. So that's simple analytics. Oh, and I guess I should talk a little bit. They have this concept of goals. Goals are just, to them at least, like pre-configured filters. So if you want to create like a pre-configured dashboard that says like, I want to see all my traffic from the United States and people using Chrome or something, you could do that and create these like pre-built reports essentially. Um, and then events too, to support custom event tracking. So like file downloads and things like that, they would show up here if I were doing any of that. Okay. So the next one is called Fathom Analytics. Uh, very similar looking dashboard. Uh, this one has a nice feature where you can share the dashboard um, via like what they call a private share link. Um, and you don't have to then have somebody you send this link to create an account with Fathom to view the data. Um, so that's helpful, like if you're billing or trying to you know, process data and give it to somebody in your department or something or a colleague of yours, you don't have to create an account for them. You can just do this quick share link. The interface I found was very snappy. Still poor accessibility, just like Simple Analytics had. It doesn't support multiple users. You can't use the UI to do certain things like creating goals. Um, this is what it looks like here for a site builder. Um, and you can see we have basically the same information up top that Simple Analytics had. If I go back to visitors, um, though there's a little bit more. I'd also be interested if everyone has their computer out. If you just go to sitebuilder.princeton.edu, we can see how accurate this real-time data is. <laughs> um, but so we, you know, we've got people on your site going up here. We'll see if that increments as people visit the site. Um, and we've got visitors, views, average time on site. New to this, that simple and links did not present was the bounce rate, which is basically of people that land on your website, how many don't visit any other pages. That's that's it. I don't think that's an essential metric to track for the, like I said, the ninety percent use case, because. A high bounce rate could be good, depending on the type of data you have on your website, right? It could mean that somebody found the information they needed on one page and they just left and they're satisfied. But some websites want high engagement, meaning that they're visiting and interacting with the site a lot more. Um, and then event completions. But the data down here is basically the same as simple analytics, right? We're seeing the page views. we got a bar chart in the background that's clearly showing the home page is the most popular. I like that. Um, we can see the top refers, direct slash unknown. So those are people that are just typing it into their address bar. Um, for the most part, that's what that means. I mean, some of this information is derived from um, data that your browser is sending. And people can manipulate that. People that are privacy conscious might be able to hide that information from the analytics software. So it's not super accurate. Um, but what is important is that it shows trends of things like that. Um, and then down here, we've got device type, desktop, phone, tablet, really simple. Um, in browsers and countries too. Up here we can see the date picker and something that um, Fathom has that Simple Analytics does not have is a comparison too. So Simple Analytics does kind of have this but there's no way to control it so it'll just say like if you're looking at a period of a week it'll show you okay the same period of last week there's like negative 20 percent compared um, but here you can actually like set the comparison range and have more control over that which is nice. Um, but again, we're looking at one single page of data. There's no other pages. This is it. There's no menus to get lost in. Um, if you wanted to find more, you can, you know, you can do filtering, you can do searches. So if I just want to click Chrome, it's going to filter out and just show me all the Chrome users, right? Okay. So if I close out on this filter, we can see this uh, real-time information went up to 18. So I guess that is working. Uh, let's see what Simple Analytics is reporting for that. Let me change this back to daily, and we'll go to today. So four, so I don't know, whatever they're doing for uh, that tracking is certainly diff different than Fathom, right? Okay, and then we'll take a look at this last one here, which is plausible. I think this is the strongest, um, most capable contender of the simple ones. Uh, the accessibility is better than most. It still has some critical issues uh, where you create like keyboard traps and you can't get out of certain modal windows and things like that or get into them. 
Um, it's got this concept of views per visit, which is nice. Very, very clean interface. It has a map for the countries and regions of your visitors. Um, you can create private share links just like the other uh, Fathom supported. It goes even beyond that too, where you can embed this uh, in a different website via an iframe and like strip away some of the extra like site chrome um, to make it look like it's like an analytic solution that you're providing. Um, this is a uh, really nice feature for me because you know we're maintaining this platform uh, this Drupal based site builder platform and I'd like to be able to create like a page where you can just click in Drupal's interface to see your analytics report and just I want to embed this single dashboard in it and let people view this. This is like um, like I said a really good use case for like the 90% but we would still allow something like Google Analytics if you want that more advanced capability. Um, yeah, they support custom dimensions, so if you're trying to track different types of information that they don't, they do that, and they have a self-hosting option, like I said. And this is uh, what it looks like for SiteBuilder uh, in the past 30 days. So I think we would all agree this is like the slightly more cleaner interface than the other two, especially if we compare it like side by side with simple analytics, just like the font choices and things like that and the color contrast. Um, I found this to be like the most pleasing to look at. Um, they've got a really nice drop-down menu for checking, uh, picking the, um, the time comparisons without immediately showing you like a date picker, but you can get to a date picker if you want. Um, and they've got like a nice comparison thing here where if I check, uh, or let's, let's say I go to seven days instead, so it's going to show seven days versus the previous seven days, and it shows the data right below it, which I think is really easy to understand and use. And the same thing with the graph here. And then again, we've got top sources, top pages. They also show you entry and exit pages too, which is nice. Um, cities, devices, getting a lot of people from Princeton. <laughs> no surprise. Um, okay, and this one is also showing 17 current visitors. We saw that giant spike from all of you four minutes ago. Uh, another thing you'll see in these all three of these is that they process data almost instantly. Google Analytics does not do that. There can be almost... Um, a uh, one to two day delay before you can get all the data processed. Um, so it's nice to don't have to wait for that. You can rely on your data a lot more than you can with Google Analytics um, if you need it right now. Okay, and uh, I put this on, um, I put these trackers, they're all JavaScript trackers. Uh, I put them on the Site Builder website three or four weeks ago and I, I pulled this data. I just wanted to see how they agreed on these uh, so-called essential metric, metrics, right? Uh, so page views, which I think is what the most important one is, they're almost all the same, which I was actually surprised at. I thought there'd be a bigger uh, variance in this, but this is promising information, right? It's nice to know that, um, you know, I'd be curious, like, if we had even more, like, if there were any big outliers of different software, like, why that might be. But everyone basically is tracking the same way for page views, which is nice. Visitors is a really interesting one. So the concept of a visitor relies on the fact that you can identify if somebody is visiting a web page, if, they, if that same person already visited a web page recently or not. Google does this by adding a tracking cookie. Um, so if you go to your web inspector and you visit any website, 80% of the websites, you'll probably see a cookie that starts with an underscore GA. Um, there's going to be at least two. Um, one of them is just going to be installed on every site, and then there's one for each tracker, Google Analytics tracker you have on the site. And this value is basically Google's like unique identifier for you as a visitor. They try to set the cookie to last for two years. Um, Safari doesn't allow that. It kills them after seven days of inactivity. But you know, by default, if you're browsing in Chrome, for example, and you visited a website, and a year and a half later you visited again, Google Analytics would recognize that that's the same visitor. Um, and they do that because they're tracking you with a cookie. This is what you cannot do without getting consent from people if you are in the European Union. Uh, so I limited this to one day because ooh, simple analytics, fathom, and plausible can't track visitors beyond one day. It's part of their privacy-focused um, uh, way of doing things. So 
Simple Analytics does not use your IP address at all to track if you're a returning visitor or not. So how do they possibly know, right? Because you need something identifiable about you to say, okay, this person was seen here before because they have the same IP address or something. But if you're going to say, I'm not going to even use IP address because that's personal identifiable information, how do you figure it out? Simple Analytics does something quite simple. They look at the referrer header, which browsers will send um, along with your request, and it says what page they were on before they landed on your website. Simple Analytics says, okay, if that value was empty, um, it means that you know that's a new visitor. But if the next time they're visiting and that value is from your own website, it means that you know that visit was already from someone that visited that website, so they count that as one visitor. It's a very simple way of doing things. A lot of people don't think it's very accurate because um, people can put whatever they want in their referrer header. Um, a lot of privacy conscious people will strip that information out. Um, in fact, it's a good common practice to do that when you're building links to things um, out of your control to like in the HTML put like a, an attribute that says don't send a referrer header when someone clicks on this because I don't want people to see that someone was on this banking application or something beforehand, right? Um, Fathom and Plausible both use IP address, but they create a hash based on that that they throw out every day. Um, so that's how they get around uh, doing that and not keeping that information too long. So I had to limit it to one day for that reason, but even when I did that, they all pretty much agree the number of visitors per one day was the same. Um, visits from country was interesting. Uh, simple, Fathom, and Plausible all pretty much were in agreement. For some reason, Google Analytics thought there was a lot more visitors from China. They all did agree that these were the top three countries of visits for a one-week period that I looked at. Um, I don't know why Google's was so different. Um, it's almost as if they miscategorized a lot of visits from the USA as from China, or maybe the other three did it wrong. <laughs> so this is the thing. You don't really know. Um, Simple, Fathom, and Plausible are much more open about how they do these things than Google is. Um, but uh, I couldn't really figure that out. I, I, actually, what, one thing to note, um, Simple Analytics, like I said, they're the ones that are the most privacy conscious. They don't use your IP address for doing this. This is typically how you figure out where someone is coming from. You use geolocation for their IP address. That's a generally perceived way of doing things accurately. Where you take an IP address, you can figure out what region of the world that IP belongs to. Um, Simple Analytics instead looks like the time zone of the user's uh, user agent, so your browser. and. You can see, like, you might as well have everybody do that. <laughs> because it's not like they were wildly off from Fathom, Plausible, and Google in terms of uh, tracking that information, which they're using based on IP address. Also, IP address is, you know, people are using VPNs and stuff. So I could be using a VPN that says I'm in the United States when I'm really in Europe, and that's going to miscategorize some where I'm coming from if you're using IP to geolocate, right? Whereas uh, your time zone would not. Okay, and then time on page, this one was all over the place. Uh, they basically categorize and do these things much differently. Google Analytics does not have a concept of time on page anymore. They call it engagement time. Um, so they all calculate how this is done slightly differently, and that's why we're seeing such a variance in this. So this is really not something you can compare apples to oranges. But I think that's okay. I think when you're looking at the data, what's probably most important is to see trends. And if, as long as the same data um, analysis is used across all of your data, then that trend will be relevant, right? Whether it says I'm on, my users are on the page for one minute or one second, as long as, you know, if someone's on the page for two minutes or two seconds, I see those trend lines, that's what's important to see, right? Um, plausible, I have no idea what's going on with them. Um, they also don't show average time for all pages, only individual pages. Um, they did have an average visit duration that was set to 44 seconds, which is much lower and is, is better there, but it's, it's a hard metric. It's a really hard metric to get right because what would you consider a time on page? If somebody opens their browser and goes to your homepage and then walks away from the computer for three hours, do you say that they were on the page for three hours? Well, they weren't doing anything. Is that really helpful information to have? Um, so Google has like advanced algorithms to figure out like, okay, 
they have to have like some sort of level of engagement with your site. They have to do some scrolling. They have to click within a certain amount of time to go to a different page and things like that. Um, so I would probably trust Google the most here because I think this is the most complicated type of thing to track. And I think Google, with the, the resources they have, probably got it, got it right the most. Um, and the last one we'll look at here is uh, visits from device category. And again, you can see that um, for the most part, they're pretty much all in agreement. So um, we can see simple for some reason. It has more for desktop. But um, yeah, it's not too bad. And so I'm almost out of time here, but um, I'm at the end anyway. So <sighs> the uh, what I, I you know I didn't have a whole lot of time to get into this in, the, in a short presentation, but what I'm just trying to convey again is that I, I sort of had a perception before going into this and doing all this research that you can't compete with Google Analytics in terms of their accuracy of the data and things like that. But I just showed that. Um, these other solutions, they do compete with it, right? If you're just talking about the simple metrics and that's all you care about, then these other solutions um, should really have another look. Um, you know, like I said, I think a lot of people just aren't doing it because Google Analytics is free. But man, is it complicated to use? And you can do a whole lot with it. You can do a lot with creating custom reports that really gives you amazing insight to your data for large websites, especially for ones that have, um, uh, you know, monetization where you, you know, you're selling something or you're trying to drive um, some sort of eventual conversion of your visitors to something, then Google Analytics or Matamo or Pewik, those are the ones to look at. But um, I think these other ones are great. So you know, like I said, we maintain SiteBuilder at Princeton. I would love to be able to use something like Plausible to put on our platform and just have a page where I embed it. And we don't have to provision user accounts for all of our thousand websites. Um, we just create like a private share link that everyone gets and um, we give them access to. And that gives you like the basic information like so that even if you're not um, doing web stuff all day in your day-to-day -day job, you can get in and you can get like a general idea about how your website's performing. Um, and because they have unlimited data retention for the most part, you can, you know, when you're doing a, a web design rebuild in three or four years, you can go back and look at this data. But Google doesn't let you do that unless you're paying for Google Analytics 360, which is like something that you only get the pricing for when you talk to them and is certainly well into the six figures. And that gives you like data retention policies that go beyond like two or three years. So that's all I have to say. Take some questions. You had mentioned that Cloudflare, Cloudflare Analytics was a little too simple. Yeah. How simpler is it than what you're showing us? Yeah, so the question was um, Cloudflare Analytics is a little too simple. How much simpler? So Cloudflare Web Analytics, if you view, um, they basically took their um, reporting interface that they use for their other products and just like put it over for web analytics. And um, it doesn't give you like um, the like various charts and graphs in the same way. It limits you to seeing either 5, 10, or 15 data points with no way to expand beyond that. That was my biggest issue with it. Um, I don't think it gave you the same breakdown for things like device categories and things like that. It's still in, in, in its infancy. And um, it's getting there, and I think it's free, too. So if you want to spin up and try it, and I should also mention, if you want to play around with other, you know, Simple, Fathom, and Plausible, if you go on their websites, they have a link to demo them. And um, you know you can see with their own data and just play around with the user interface and look at them. Cloudflare doesn't have that, unfortunately. Chris? Uh, GA4 has the Booker Studio, which allows you to do recording and things like that. And you can embed reports into their web pages. Right. Send somebody a link. I saw that one of the solutions you present has that. Uh, that's another advantage of GA4. For sure, yeah. Google, you know, Looker Studio is a big advantage. Um, another big advantage with Google Analytics is it integrates with Google Search so that you can see. Um, if people are using Google to search for things, you can see what terms they searched for that landed them on your website. Plausible, I, I don't think Fathom or Simple do this. Plausible can actually do that too if you integrate Plausible with your Google search um, account, which is nice. But yeah, there's you know, Google Analytics, the, the capabilities you can do with it is astounding. I mean, I went through, in preparation for this presentation, I went through like hours of LinkedIn learning just so I learn more about Google Analytics. And it's just like crazy, the, the stuff you can do in it. Um, 
but yeah, like I said, a lot of people are trying to get away from it for the regulatory reasons. Georgia? No. Yeah, so I don't endorse any of these companies. Um, no, I mean, uh, when you sign up, do they tell you you... Oh, you not me personally. No. <laughs> okay. You know, like... When you yeah, no, you can cancel any time. No, it's all self-service. It's self-service. Um, you can pay monthly or yearly. You get a discount if you pay yearly for all of them. Um, but it's self-service, you can cancel any time. Yeah. And it, in fact, they have two of them have thirty day trials. One of them has a two week trial, so I had to pay for thirty. Yeah, that was another. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's not too bad. It also scales up pretty well. Like if we were to use this on our site builder platform, for example, it's like we're talking I don't know at most like a thousand dollars a month or something to cover all websites. It's not like terrible. Uh, I would say. No. If if you're talking about if somebody visited your website um, from a YouTube video, yes, you can use UTM parameters in the, the the URL that you share, and all of them have a way of you know tracking that. So this is Fathom. Um, Fathom, I'm a little less sure of, but this one definitely does. It has a way to do. Uh, I'm not sure where it is, but there is a way. Oh, sources, yeah, top sources. Um, actually, it goes beyond that. So yes, this is the top sources. This is looking at the referrer header, but UTM parameters are different. That's um, where you could actually specify in the URL that someone clicks. Like, okay, this person came from YouTube. This is the specific video they came from, and that sort of thing. Um, all of them support that. I actually think it might be hidden because I'm not using any of them, so it's not exposed here. Do you see any through lines from the discrepancies between these uh, reporting platforms? Any through lines? What do you mean? Any similarities? Like, oh, these are the pages that are like double counting, or because you show different numbers for them. Oh, yeah, so like, why are there discrepancies? Yeah, I did not. Um, I, what I would imagine it is, is how they handle bots differently. So years and years ago, it was easy to filter out bots because they didn't run JavaScript. But a lot of them do now. So because they're running JavaScript, they're actually triggering this tracking scripts this to run, right? So whatever you're doing to do spam prevention and bot um, mitigation has to be a lot more sophisticated now. Yeah, that's what I would think. Um, so. You know, a, a common spam technique that people will do is they inject into their, in their referrer header like spam links. So that if you're viewing the dashboard, you see links to like, hey, visit this website.com or something. And because you can put in, this is taking um, information from the HTTP request, which you can put whatever you want in there. Browsers pre populated with something, but you don't have to initiate an HTTP request from your browser. You can do it from the command line and put whatever you want in. Um, so that's a you know each of them have documentation that describes like how to do spam prevention and mitigate all that, and they do some level of it to a degree. All right, thanks everybody.